ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا the muslim ummah has been undergoing and experiencing tremendous and devastating trials and turmoil, tribulations. The more we wish for them to go away, the more they seem to stick around and become worse. These trials, these trials are twofold. These trials are twofold. There's the actual fitna of the ongoing unrest, demonstrations, protests, fights amongst the Muslims, uh, riots, revolution, you name it. You see it, it's all over the place, it's occupied the whole world. In fact, that's like what the whole world is speaking about. Even major events, you know, of earthquakes and whatever are getting almost no attention, no media coverage, because everybody's focusing on what's happening in the Middle East and in the Arab countries. Uh, and there's the fitna. Now, this is one fold of the fitna. And uh, this is one aspect of the fitna. The other one, which may be worse, is that how uh, some of the Muslims either do not know how to react. The, the, the worst fitna is some Muslims don't even know how to react. Or worse, they're adopting false ideologies and methodologies in dealing with this fitna. So there's the fitna that is existing right now. And the worst part is that Muslims don't know what's going on. Am I with this or against it? Uh, wh where do I stand? What are we supposed to do? Do we support demonstrations and the revolution or do we hold back? Do I speak or do I be quiet? I, I don't know. And that person is in a safer position than the one who's already adopted a position that is not in agreement with the deen, that is based on emotionalism strictly. And this is further, uh, you know, worsening the situation and making the fitna more difficult to deal with. Due to what preceded, it is fundamental, it's a fundamental must that we address this issue, attempting to shed some light on it um, and uh, thereby uh, and present, I'm sorry, the Muslim, the Muslims with the Islamic position. Present the Muslims with the Islamic position based on the Quran and the Sunnah continue according to the understanding of the Salaf, the righteous predecessors. Because you will see, without that last factor, everybody's understanding the Quran and the Sunnah their way. And everybody's using the Quran and the Sunnah to support the opposing views. It's ajib. Everyone uses the Quran and the Sunnah to, to they quote a hadith, they quote an ayah that this is in favor of you know what these people are doing and the other way around. So what is that determining factor? What is that fine line between who's really referring to the Quran and the Sunnah or applying it in the current situation, those who understood it or those who understand it now like they understood it back then. And this is what this lecture is about. Insha'Allah Ta'ala. It is a very sad uh, division. It is very sad the division we see among the Muslims as if we are in need of more division. We are already divided. Needless to say, you see it. Groups and denominations and uh, fractions and sects and you name it. Uh, the last thing we need is more division because that will further distance us from our aims and objectives of reviving the Ummah and having Khilafah and all the good things which you all want. And that's not going to happen in this fashion until a strong body of Muslims upon the truth 
are able to oppose the evils of the world. Whether it is among other Muslims, or among claimants to Islam, or among the disbelievers in general. It's not going to happen while we are in this particular state. And the fitna of today is sure not helping, even though some may claim it is. We will see that uh, according to the standards of our righteous predecessors, no way. The first thing we need to realize and internalize, the first thing, pay attention, which we need to realize and internalize, is that the theme of all these events, the theme, the underlying theme is, quote unquote, change. What everybody wants, change. We want change. Remove this guy because we want change. We're tired of this old stuff. We want change. Everybody wants change. That's the underlying theme. That's the theme that they're pushing for. Fair enough. Everyone seems to want to change. Therefore, in order to be able to adequately obtain sound rulings on how to deal with the issue or with this fitna, we really need to evaluate what Islam has to say about change. What is the Islamic position about change? Can you just change anytime you like it? Is change something that we feel like doing and so we act upon it? Or does it have to be in agreement with the Islamic guidelines? So we must first understand change in the Islamic perspective. So we may see what the ruling is concerning the current events. Uh, because when we don't, and of course this change, this change which we will be evaluating is according to the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the Salaf, not emotions, because not very often, always emotions make matters worse. Always. Emotions make matters worse. If you don't abide by the revelation, even if it opposes your feeling, pay attention. Islam is a religion of discipline. You are expected and obliged to contain yourself and withhold on your emotions. I can give you hundreds of examples, one which no one can deny. If a child of yours dies, may Allah protect your children, what are you supposed to do in Islam? Are you allowed to slap your cheek? Are you allowed to go crazy, scream, run, do anything that is obnoxious? No. Even though your son or your daughter dying is, is a devastating event. This is something that no human being can be nonchalant about. But, you, but Islam says that you have to have sabr. And you have to say, inna lillahi wa inna alayhi raji'un. And we have, you know, even things to say at the time of calamity. So Islam is about discipline, not about, oh, I'm tired of this, or I feel this, with all due respect to your feelings. If they're going to oppose and conflict with the revelation of Allah, then we do not need your expression of your feelings. Because that expression is a fitna in and of itself. So let's see. We're going to tackle this from three dimensions or three aspects or three angles. Choose the term that you prefer. First, What is, what is intended by change according to the Islamic view? التغيير يعني إنكار وضع 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 مخالف الشرع. أو إنكار إنكار وضع مخالف الشرع. What is تغيير? It is to reject a situation which opposes the Islamic law. That's إنكار. تغيير تغيير causing a change is denying, rejecting a situation which opposes the Deen of Allah. And striving to change it. You reject that thing which is in disagreement with the deen of Allah, then you make the necessary effort to change it. Not that you just watch it, as we will see. Whether it is related to the dunya or the deen, anything which is wrong, a Muslim, for him to make a change, for him to make a change, he must be in agreement with the deen of Allah. And he must reject that thing in his heart, then he must make the effort necessary to make the change. 
What is the evidence? The hadith which all of you know. In Sahih Muslim, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ تغيير. Remember it said تغيير change. فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِهِ فَأَلَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِرِسَانِهِ فَأَلَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِقَلْبِهِ وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفُ الْإِيمَانِ Whosoever amongst you sees a munkar, anything which is evil, فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ Let him change it with his hand. If he's unable to do it, then with his tongue. If he's unable to do it, then with his heart, but that is the least of faith. Now that doesn't justify what some of the people are doing. Because that hadith has to be understood in the light of other narrations and in the light of the application of the righteous predecessors. Because you will see that they didn't take the hadith the way people take it today. So the term taghir then means, because now taghir is coming from who? Who's the one who told us to change it? The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Can you change it in a way which he didn't legislate? No. So the first thing is that that change must be in agreement with the Sharia. Because the one who told us to change it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is the one who Allah gave the Sharia. So he's not going to tell us to change something without giving us the tool or the mean. Otherwise, he's given us instructions which we cannot fulfill. Impossible. Because Allah says, Akmal tu lakum. Deenakum, your religion has been perfected for you. Everything which we need regarding a major matter or a minor matter has been addressed and clarified. You just need the people of knowledge to, to tell it to us. If people don't have knowledge, which is the common situation, then they run their mouths and they complain and they criticize and they don't even know 80% of the narrations concerning the subject matter. So on what basis are you accepting, rejecting, criticizing and refuting? If you haven't even read the narrations, and you will see in the, in the internet world and otherwise, the people's comments are usually, you know, they lack the most basic knowledge of the matter. Someone who's angry and he thinks that you're an agent for some government and khalas. This is what is stuck in his mind. Give us a dalil for what you say, he will not be able to present you with one. So then, the change must be in agreement with the deen. Question. Big old question mark. Demonstrations. Are they from the deen? Answer is no. And we challenge anyone to prove otherwise. But be careful of quoting the weak narration. The weak narration attributed to Umar radiallahu anhu that when he became Muslim, he told Prophet ﷺ, are we not upon the truth? And they are upon false. He said, yes, Umar. He said, then why are we scared? And they went in two rows to the Kaaba, and they, you know, scared the Qurayshis. That weak narration, which the people quote to support that Muslims back then were having a form of demonstration, is something which you cannot use. And that's the only thing they have to cling on to. That's the only thing they have to cling on to. Now, everything else is against them. Demonstrations are from the disbelievers. Common sense. Please, anyone who begs to deny or to oppose, then show us what, who, who first brought the idea of having a demonstration, be it peaceful demonstration or otherwise. We're not speaking about the kind of demonstration. The idea of going out in the street and carrying signs and placards and what have you, trying to call for something or demand a right or ask for a change is something which Islam didn't bring. If that was an effective manner, if it was an effective tool or mean in the sight of Allah, he would have taught it to the Prophet ﷺ, who would have taught it to the Ummah. But they didn't. And you all know, you all know how many trials the Muslims had to undergo in the early times. There were many situations that called for a peaceful demonstration. But this was not part of their manhaj. This was not something that they did. So we learned this from the non-Muslims. And you all know that the percentage of peaceful demonstrations are, you know, the percentage is very low. 
somehow it turns violent. Somehow after a few minutes into it, the youth, the Shabab, get excited and they're fed up with the situation and they see a police car, so they, you know, they try to damage it. The police retaliates, someone dies, and the list goes on. They burn down cars, burn down tires in the street. You see it all the time. So whether the demonstration is peaceful or not, it remains foreign to Islam. And we said that the means must be in agreement with Islam. So what everybody's doing now, as means of change, is trying to change a munkar in a way which the Prophet didn't legislate, I'll give you the result, failure. Failure, even if it appears to be successful. Failure in the long run. It may bring some success. There's nothing that is pure evil. Even a snake, you get some medicine from it. Even a, a rat, it may eat the cockroaches in your house. Any evil contains some element of good. Now we're not going to say that what's happening, there's no good in it. Alhamdulillah. We ask Allah to bring the goodness out of the corruption and the evil that is taking place. Nevertheless, that doesn't justify the evil and make it acceptable or good. It doesn't. So the people are trying to make that change in a manner which the Prophet ﷺ didn't legislate. Imam Malik said, Nothing, nothing will rectify the, the, the late part of this ummah, the latter part of this ummah, except that which rectified the first part. Can't happen. You can't get results that are totally pleasing to Allah, which, which require or bring about Allah's aid and assistance in the full sense except when you follow the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So are they, are the means legal or illegal? The first element is that the, the, the means that are used today are illegal. And now, mind you, we're speaking about peaceful demonstrations, still we're saying it's illegal. Don't ask about khuruj. Don't ask about going against the Muslim ruler, provided he's a Muslim. Now, for me to sit here, or any one of us, to come and say, as the people do today, it's ajeeb, an unbelievable carelessness, unbelievable negligence. People have no reservation. Oh, oh, the president of this country, I'm not going to name, I'm not going to name anyone. Oh, he's a kafir man. Oh, this is a kafir regime. This is a kafir country. This is a kafir government. He's a kafir. He's a kafir. Everybody's a kafir. And he's sitting at home, you know, millions of miles away, he hasn't met the guy, he never had a conversation with him, he doesn't know anything except what the news bring to him. Huh? Even though Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, in ja'akum fasiqum bi naba'in, fatabayyanu, an tusibu qawman bi jahalatin, fatusbihu ala ma fa'altum nadimeen. Or you who have believed, if you believe, if an evil person, if a corrupt, disobedient person bring news to you, investigate. Lest you will uh, with ignorance wrong someone so you will become over that which you have done regretful oh he's a kafir that's not how it works the prophet sallallahu said to the sahaba when he told them when he told them about those who would be in charge whom they will see things concerning that they will disagree with they said shall we go out against them shall we fight them he said la no illa أن تروا كفرا بواحا عندكم فيه من الله برهان. Unless you see, we said this before. Not you hear, not you read, not someone conveys to you in an email until you see with the eyes that Allah gave you. كفرا disbelief بواحا blatant, blatant with absolutely no doubt concerning it. Kufr that no two people can disagree on if they have the basic understanding of Islam. That you, not only that, you have an evidence from Allah that this is kufr. And we know that there are matters of ishtihad where someone may make a judgment that, that may be kufr, but they're not declared kufar. Like many of the ulama who say Allah is everywhere. That expression is an expression of disbelief. 
Imam Abu Hanifa, in fact, Rahimullah said to someone, he, he said, Man ankar anna Allah fi sama, faqad kafar. Whosoever denies that Allah is above the creation, he has disbelieved. But they didn't go declare a kafir. Now every Muslim you see, where's Allah? He says, everyone say, you're a kafir. No, 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 no. There are many steps to be taken before you can say this person is insisting on an element of disbelief. And the evidence does not entertain interpretation. So it's a very delicate matter. But today people have no reservation. So then, if khuruj, which is fighting against the ruler, you know, requires that you prove he's a disbeliever, which is difficult unless a scholar tells you, then, and that is haram, then even demonstrations, we're not even speaking about khuruj. Khuruj is, is a major sin. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ called the khawarij kilabun nar, the dogs of the hellfire, because of the evil. They will declare the Muslims kuffar, and they will have no problem in killing them. They will have no problem in killing them. That is a major sin. Demonstrations is not allowed. If you want a change, there are Islamic ways to bring about the change. You have a problem with the ruler, with your mudir at work. Because now, you know, next thing you know, people, the employees are going to demonstrate. Say, yeah, man, he's not giving us our rights. We asked for an extra 10 minutes for the lunch break, and he deprived us of the extra 10 minutes. No good mudir. Come on, you guys. Everybody comes tomorrow with a sign, and we will stand downstairs and scream. No. What is he going to do? He's going to fire all of you right from upstairs. He will send you the, you know, the paper of, of, you know, that says that you're fired. He will throw it out the window. You will have to pick it up and go look for another job. But if someone went to him and said, Ya Fadir al-Mudir, we have an issue over here and you've been very kind to us. And we have you know, learned from your, from your kindness and gentleness that we will never ask you for something and you will say no. Once you put him in the corner, man, chances are he's going to say no problem. You can take 20 minutes break. Because there's a way to deal with things. So with the ruler, we have been taught that you take him on the side. And the people of knowledge advise them. You don't get on the member and start screaming and getting everybody, you know, incited to go against them. And that's what happens in demonstrations. We will mention some of the evils of demonstrations uh, not too far from now. But the second question, the first question is for people to bring a change, we need to meet three criteria for Muslims to, to bring about a change. Three criteria. Criteria number one, is it in agreement with Islam? The means, are they in agreement with Islam? We said demonstrations and riots and protests and what have you, psh, off the list. Second, assuming they were, or assuming you brought, used another means, is the slogan, is the call which the people are calling for that of Islam or not? Are actually, are the people actually calling for Islamic rulership or not? Let it be known. If they're not asking for Islam, then they're asking for Jahiliyyah. Because we have either Islam or Jahiliyyah. Either ignorance or the deen of Allah. And these two are never compatible. So if the people are actually not calling for Islam, whatever else it is they're calling to is a form of ignorance. Nationalism. Like this guy, Amr Khalid, may Allah rectify his condition, he told the Egyptian people, spill your blood for Egypt. Kill yourselves for Egypt. Kill yourselves for Egypt? La ilaha illallah. Since when does a Muslim kill himself for a country? You kill, you, if you're going to die, it's for the sake of Allah. If you're going to die, it must be for the sake of Allah. And we will see some of the evidences. For a country, people are calling for what? We will see in a little bit. They're not really calling for Islam. We wish... If everyone was calling for Islam, we say, huh? Ya Allah, Allah understand. They use the wrong means, but yani at least they're calling for something good. No, wrong means, wrong call. If they're not calling for Islam, it's no good. Listen to this. And the last, I'm sorry, before we will elaborate. The third one, the third criteria, can we ensure the positive results? If you're using the right means and the call which you're calling for is Islam, are you able to guarantee that the outcome will be safe, secure, and positive? Or are you going to create more evil than the already existing evil? If you can't meet that last one, then change is not allowed in Islam. I will repeat them. 
There are three things which we need to meet for a change to be made in Islam. First, the means must be Islamic. Second, the, the call, the slogan, that which you call in the people to the change should be to Islam, not to something else, not to democracy, not to anything else. And lastly, you should be able to ensure that the outcome will be better than what is already existing. If you're going to bring more evil, then you can't do it. Islamically, you can't do it. And we have many evidences and principles for that. Even the Prophet ﷺ told Aisha that he wanted to destroy the Kaaba. Why? In order to rebuild it according to the, the foundation of Ibrahim ﷺ. But he told her, I'm afraid that your, your people are recent. They just left disbelief, you know. And even the Kuffar used to magnify the Kaaba. Even the Kuffar used to venerate the Kaaba. He said, I'm afraid that your people are recent into Islam, meaning this thing won't click in their mind. They will see the Messenger of Allah destroying the Kaaba. You try to explain to them, no, no, we're trying to build it again. It doesn't register. Because of their level of understanding of Islam, he left it alone. He wanted to do something, alayhi salatu salam. He left it alone. Why? The evil which he feared will be greater. So he left it alone. If we can ensure that what's coming is better, then we need to leave it alone. Now, what, what has come now? What can anyone name one, you know, recent or sound positive change ever since they've overthrown, you know, whatever in Tunisia and, 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 and uh, in Egypt? No. Continue to read the news. There are still protests. There are still people dying. And now people are demonstrating about other rights. Now they don't want the army. They want this. They want that. It's not going to khalas. It clicked in their brain. Every time you don't like something, you run in the street. You sleep in the street. You have a tent in the street. And you scream out as, as loud as you can. And mix with women. And abandon the salah. And have songs and music. Khalas. This is how we want to change. That's how it clicked in the brains of all the people. Look, look in the world, it's unbelievable. Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, uh, uh, Sultanate Oman, uh, Jordan, Yemen, Algeria, nothing is left. Lebanon and Syria next on the list, you know, but Lebanon is so busted and anything that happens there is just, you know, is just gonna crumble. But the point being, I mean, this is gonna, and now it's spreading in China, they try to do it, it failed. Did you read the news? In China, they try to put it together demonstration. Maybe some people change their mind. Khalas, now everyone wants to use this as means of change. And what are the results? The, the mudir, the big mudir, sends his soldiers and forces to crush the people. And people die. And they, they film them in the hospital, you know, crying over your, your, your relative. Tayyib, we're sad for you and for him. What were you doing outside, ya akhi? What were you doing? Standing in front of the police, you know, teasing them. Shoot me. Shoot me if you can. So he shoots him. Then he falls on the floor. <laughs> Why were you? Go home, ya akhi. Now you rumble. And when they shoot, you're going to cry and go die. Why? Why? If anyone had some peace of mind, you sit at home, akhi. You don't like this. You're not ready for it. Sit at home. Mind your business. Maybe they're right. Maybe they're wrong. You're not going to make a change. That's what's happening in the world. People are dying. Now people don't care that someone died. But we will see how big it is in the sight of Allah to kill a Muslim. And Muslims are being killed wholesale. And they're putting themselves in this predicament. They, they share the blame. Yes, we're not justifying killing civilians ever. But you are asking for it. You know that this, this regime is of, of, of this kind. And we will see how Islamic Islam uh, you know, brings about change in these issues. طيب. Now listen to, to support the last one. Listen to this hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, the hadith is Sahih Muslim. مَنْ قُتِلَ تَحْتَ رَايَةً يَغْضَبُ أَوْ وَيُقَاتِلُ فَلَيْسَ مِنْ أُمَّتِي وَفِي فَقِتْلَةٌ جَاهِلِيَّةٌ He said alayhi salatu salam, Whosoever fights under, under the raya, the flag, huh? the flag of blindness or nationalism, he fights for the nation. And he does, you know, whatever he does for the nation, فَلَيْسَ مِنْ أُمَّتِهِ He is not one of my nation. In another narration he said, فَقِتْلَةٌ جَاهِلِيَّةٌ His death is a death of ignorance. 
the death of Jahiliya, meaning it's very dangerous, very dangerous declaration from the Prophet All these people who may have died in this recent, in these recent days, if their intent while out there was not the deen of Allah and the spread of Islam, and they were calling for anything else, even if it's their country, this is a, a death of Jahiliya wal billah. We ask Allah to, to pardon them. We ask Allah to pardon all the Muslims who made mistakes. We're not happy for this, don't misunderstand. But we're trying to say this so those who hear in the future will take it easy, will slow down, will rationalize before they jump into conclusions and act on emotions. فَقِتْلَةٌ جَاهِلِيَّةٌ وَالْعِبْيَةٌ as mentioned in Ibn Kathir, or Abu Ibn Al-Athir in al nihaya he said, مِنَّ الْعَمَاءُ وَهِيَ الضَّلَالَ it's, it's from blindness, which is misguidance, when you're unable to see the way and the path. And like I said, what are the people calling for? It is not Islam. Allah is merciful. I've been preparing for this lecture ever since this fitna happened. And just, just right now, before I left my house to come over here, I'm always checking the news on, on the internet. Not that I believe everything they say, but I know that we will learn some of their views, some of their goals in, their, in the media, in the actual articles that they write and they publish. Why? Because this is the brainwashing tool that the media uses against the masses. CNN.com. I printed it for you. Arab youth want democracy, not theocracy. Theocracy is when, you, when one nation is under a god. Yani the, the ultimate judge and ruler is one god, which is Islam. The Arab youth want democracy, not theocracy. Long article, but I will quote, having witnessed the failures of Islamist regimes in Sudan, Iran, the Taliban in Afghanistan, and Saudi Arabia, and the terror of the Bin Ladens of the world, they are not interested in theocracy, but democracy, with, uh, with its greater equality. <laughs> equality. There's no difference between men and women, between a believer and disbeliever. Everything goes. Uh, pluralism. Freedoms, freedoms and opportunities. And the whole thing goes on to prove with evidences why the, the youth are really, you know, they're not really calling for Islam. And this is their goal. This is a plot. The plot is that they come in and have democracy take over the Muslim Ummah. Once we accept democracy as a substitute for theocracy, we are done. We have surrendered ourselves to them. They no longer have to fight anything or anyone. We will run towards them. We will beg them to bring their democracy into their country. Which democracy? Secular democracy. Separation between the state and the church. Religion and the state. Leave your faith at home. Leave it in your place of worship. You want it to apply amongst the people? No, no, no. Because they have freedom of speech and freedom of expression and freedom of whatever. And you can't conflict with that. Yeah, you have a problem someone drawing, uh, you know, a picture of your prophet? You have a problem someone making fun of him? What's your problem? This is his freedom. He has a pen and a, and a paper. Khalas, leave him alone. That's what's going to happen. That's what's because so the plot, yeah, Muslims. The blood is not, is just getting rid of Fulan and you know, getting excited and screaming. There's something that is being cooked in the background. There's a plan that is aimed at, at, at demolishing the Muslims. The best way to do it is in the known traditional methodology or of Farrik Tasud, divide and conquer, divide and conquer. If they're together, it's gonna be too tough to deal with it. No, divide them and come and sit down in the middle. They will kill each other. You just watch. Democracy. So when they're able to control the youth, they don't have to worry about the Islamists and those who go for Islam because their voice will be gone. 
their voice will not be significant enough to compete with the masses and the population which wants democracy. And I couldn't believe my eyes. I said, subhanAllah, Arab youth, of course they say in Arab because now it's happening in the Arab world, want democracy, not the other. I read this, I said, la ilaha illallah, in total agreement with the subject tonight. And I wanted to prove this to you somehow, and alhamdulillah, there it is. Go back home and see it. There's something in the background. Tayyip. Um, furthermore, we learn from the Prophet وسلم, concerning fighting or, or doing all this, this nonsense for something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when people are killed in the process. We have the hadith uh, wherein the Prophet وسلم, said, a man will come to Allah on the day of resurrection with the one who killed him and holding his hand. And he will say, Ya Rabb, hadha qatalani. He will say, Oh Allah, my master, this man has killed me. Allah Azza wa Jal will say, Lima qatalta? Why did you kill him? Fayaqul qataltahu li takunu l'izzata lak. I killed him so might, so might and sovereignty may be only yours. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says, Fayaqul Allah Azza wa Jal, fahiyya li, fa'innaha li, it is mine. Meaning the purpose was legitimate. This is in the context of the struggle of the Muslims with the non-Muslims. It is not by blowing up a, uh, an airplane or a building or a supermarket. That's not Islam, not Islam. This is terrorism practiced by Muslims and non-Muslims alike. In fact, we suffer the worst end of it. More than any nation on earth, the Muslims are deal the worst with the worst terrorists in the world, quite honestly. Even though some of us, may Allah guide them, have taken a share in this nonsense. We don't have this kind of stuff. You don't go attack regular people, women, children, elderly, and, and say that you're doing this for the sake of Allah. It is not for the sake of Allah, in this, in this fashion. Another man will be brought with his killer, and he will say to Allah that he killed me, and, Allah, and he will say, why did you kill him? He will say, so such and such person will be the ruler. So the sovereignty and the rulership will be for Fulan. And he will then become responsible for having killed him. So the one who narrated the hadith, radiallahu anhu, he said, فَاتَّقِهَا Then be careful of this. Then avoid this. That you wind up killing a Muslim so that one person may take over the rulership over another. And Muslims are killed in the process. Tayyip. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Concerning fitna, because what we're having right now is fitna, tribulations. It's a test from Allah. And we have strict guidelines in Islam on how to deal with them. As you know, everything has been addressed. Now listen to this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, إِنَّ أُمَّتَكُمْ هَذِهِ جُعِلَ عَافِيَتُهَا فِي أَوَّلِهَا this nation of yours, the good things were made to come in the beginning. This nation of yours, the good things were made to come in the beginning for the early generation. And the later generation will be afflicted with trials and things which you will dislike. The fitna will come and it will refine the one before it. Yani every time one comes, it will make the one that came before it lighter. It will continue to get worse. The fitna will come until the believers say, this will be my destruction. This fitna and this fitna I will be destroyed. Then it will go away. It will depart. وَتَجِيءُ الْفِتْنَةِ Then another one will come, فَيَقُولْ مُؤْمِنْ هَادِي هَادِي He will say, no, this one, this one. Meaning the fitna will continue to escalate. They will continue to come. And everyone, the believer, will say, this will be my destruction. Hudayfa, please have the children be silent. Please have the children be silent. Hudayfa رضي الله عنه narrated in a sahih hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said about this, فِتْنَةٌ عَمْيَاءٌ صَمَّاءٌ عليها دعاة على أبواب النار فإن تمت يا حذيفة فإن تمت يا حذيفة وأنت عاض على جذل 
خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ أَنْ تَنْتَبِعَ أَحَدَ مِنْهُمْ الله أكبر He said عليه الصلاة والسلام The fitna will be عمياء blind صماء deaf Meaning the people will not hear or see it It will just be chaos Like you see today Chaos You just see the news and everybody's running in the streets You don't even know what's going on He said عليه الصلاة والسلام He said And there are callers Calling to this fitna at the doors of Jahannam Come Come to the fitna Now listen to this he said alayhi salatu salam to Hudayfa, Ya Hudayfa, if you were to die while biting on the trunk of a tree, not the branch, the trunk of a tree is better for you than following any one of these who call you to the fitna. Better for you. And this is the way of the righteous predecessors. Like in Bukhari, Ibn Umar, they came to him and said, Ya Ibn Umar, you know, you've got big status here. Help us out in this, you know, fight. He said, he said, didn't Allah say, uh, وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى uh, uh, فَقَاتِلُوهُمْ وَيَكُونُ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونُ فِتْنَ وَيَكُونُ الدِّينُ لِلَّهِ Fight them so there will be no fitna and the deen will be for Allah. He said, we had already fought so there will be no fitna and the deen was for Allah. You are fighting so that there will be fitna and the deen will not be for Allah. Ibn Umar held back. This is the, the scholar. The sound scholar. Many of the ulama today, by the way, haven't said anything. And some people think, and especially Egyptian scholars, some think this is weakness. No. These are people who are following the, of the righteous predecessors. At that time, they wouldn't say anything. They don't want to instigate. They don't want to incite. They don't want to get involved. And they don't believe they're qualified enough to be addressing this issue. They leave it for the senior scholars and they remain silent. As opposed to those who come and scream and make it even worse. You know, as we will see, a word, the tongue will be sharp, sharper than the sword. It will be sharper than the sword. One thing you say may make the masses go crazy. Right. Um, furthermore, the Prophet said, إِذَا اللِّسَانُ فِيهَا أَشَدْ بِنْ وَقْعَ السَّيْفِ Then the tongue is severer than that of the sword. The thing which you say in, in, in this time of fitna. Allah taught us, but maybe we haven't been reading the Quran and the Sunnah. Listen to this ayah. You know this, the context of this ayah? When, when the, the Sahaba thought that the Prophet ﷺ divorced his wives and he, he abandoned them and there was uh, people in the masjid were you know, screaming and you know, the Prophet ﷺ divorced his wives and it was a calamity. Umar anhu came. I didn't hear to all this you know, talk. And he went straight to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked him whether he had divorced his wives. He told them no. No one asked. They assumed. And they started speaking as if it already happened. Allah gave this ayah. And when there comes to them information about public security or fear, they spread it around. They announce it. But look what Allah said. But if they had referred it back to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, or those of authority among them, who are those? The ulama, the scholars. Then the ones who can draw correct conclusions from it would have known about it. Those who can deduce the ruling, who can tell you how to move in this fitna, they would have known about it. These are the people of knowledge. And if it was not for the favor of Allah upon you and His mercy, you would have followed Satan except for a few. Most of the people will follow Satan except for a few. So we need to refer back to the scholars. And the scholars have told us, according to the deen, that the demonstrations are not part of Islam. And that killing a Muslim is a great crime in the sight of Allah. And that going against the ruler, if he's a Muslim, is a great crime in the deen of Allah. So uh, on what basis are the people acting? And why are they spreading the news concerning security and fear, rather than referring it back to the scholars, who can guide them in this regard? Abdullah ibn Umar, uh, ibn Amr radiallahu anhu said, there will be a fitna which will overcome the Arabs. It's death therein will be in the hellfire. We don't know if this is about this one. 
The tongue in that time would be more severe than the strikes of a sword. He also said, we were around the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when tribulations were mentioned. He said, when you see the oaths of a people become murky, the oaths, they swear, they swear and they lie. And their trusts weaken and they become like this and he netted his fingers together. They become like this. I stood up and went on and went to him saying, May I be sacrificed for you. What shall I do in those times? He said, Alayhi salatu salam, Stick to your home and take hold of your tongue. Hold fast to what you know and abandon whatever you do not know. Adhere to matters concerning yourself only and leave the matters of the masses. SubhanAllah. Stay at home, brothers. Don't get involved. If some people are insisting on these demonstrations and this revolution, don't get involved. If you're doubtful whether you should go with them because it's a noble cause or it's something which is displeasing to Allah because it does entail haram, then stay at home and listen to the advice of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not getting involved is not going to harm you. Getting involved is certainly doubtful. And according to the evidences, it's haram. Allah says, Ya ibadi ladina amanu, ladina amanu inna ardi wasi'a fa'iyaya fa'abudun. All my slaves who have believed, very my land is vast. So only my only me worship. Which means if you have to run away from one place to another for your peace of mind and security, so you may worship Allah, do so. Don't remain in the place of fitna. He said, alayhi salatu salam, uh, in the hadith of Abu Hurairah, Woe and Afwan, Aywa. Fitan, in the hadith of Abu Bakr, the fitan shall take place. Wherein the one sitting, listen, the one sitting is better than the one walking. And the one walking is better than the one hastening forth, the one rushing into the fitna. Truly, when it comes or befalls, let the one with camels remain with his camels. And let the one with sheep remain with his sheep, and let the one with land remain with his land. Then a man said, O Messenger of Allah, what about the one without camels, sheep, or land? Someone doesn't have camels to remain with, doesn't have sheep to remain with, doesn't have a land to stay at and avoid the fitna. He said, let him take this, his sword, the weapon, and strike it against the rock. Strike, not against the Muslim, against the rock. Let him be saved if he can be saved. O oh Allah, have I conveyed? O oh Allah, have I conveyed? O oh Allah, have I conveyed? The hadith is a Muslim. Don't get involved. Because when you're fighting against the police, you're also fighting against Muslims. And you cannot come and declare them as kuffar. You don't know where he was praying, and you don't know his situation. Because Allah says concerning killing a Muslim, وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمْ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعَنَهُ وَأَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا But whoever kills a believer intentionally, his recompense is hell, wherein he will abide eternally. And Allah has become angry with him, and has cursed him, and has prepared for him a great punishment. All of these for killing a believer. One believer, intentionally. How many Muslims are being killed today? and people don't pay attention to the value of this blood. And before it was the non-Muslims killing us, and so we were just swallowing it, because there's not much we can do. Now we're killing ourselves. Now we're killing each other, and they're simply watching and pushing democracy in the process. Shaykh al-Sabh ibn Taymi rahimahullah said, rarely does a person go against the ruler, go out against the leader, fighting him, except that the evil consequences of his actions are greater than the good. The evil consequences are greater than the good. He also said, for this reason, the people of Sunnah warn against fighting during times of tribulation due to the authentic narrations from the Prophet ﷺ to the extent that they mention it in the writings of Aqidah. It's part of our Aqidah, part of our belief system, the creed that which we tie our belief around. That's how important the matter is. He said, and they commanded patience during the rule of tyrants instead of fighting them to, due to the consequences of innocent blood being spilled, wealth and honor being abused. 
Hudayb ibn al-Yamin said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there will be a tribulation wherein the minds of men will be seized, such as that a sound-minded man will hardly be seen. The fitna will be so great that one person who seems to understand what's going on, you can hardly find him. The people's minds will be seized. Everybody's just acting wild, wild, obnoxious. It's, it's just amazing. Abu Musa radiallahu said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, before the coming of the hour, there will be harj. They said, and what is the harj? What is harj? He said, killings. It won't be your killing of the polytheists, but rather when you kill each other, such that a man will kill his neighbor, his brother, his cousin, and his uncle, his uncle and his cousin. And now the people of the same country are fighting. One is with the opposition and one is with the government and they're killing each other. The Prophet ﷺ said, this is from the signs of the Day of Judgment. He said another hadith, whilst we are, they, they said to him, they said when he said that, whilst we are sound minded, whilst we are sound minded then, he said the minds of the people in that era will be seized and they will remain from the people, those who are lowly and unintelligent. Most of them will think they have a basis, but they have no basis. Subhanallah al-Azim. They're unintelligent, foolish people. They think they're upon something, but they're not upon anything. Ajeeb. The Messenger of Allah, and this is the hadith which we need to reflect on. All of them, but this in particular. The hadith of Al-Maqdal ibn Aswad. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the joyful one is he who is protected from tribulations and he when afflicted bears patience. The joyful one, as Sa'id, the happy one, the joyful one is the one who is protected from fitna. The one who doesn't get involved in the fitna, that's the happy one. The one who gets involved will get his shareness, his share of sadness. Let me tell you something that happens in these demonstrations among their consequences. Replacing security with fear. Before, there was some sort of security. Even though some Muslims were being harassed, others were being imprisoned, we don't deny that. They were being wronged, oppressed, killed, no doubt. It was happening, but still, there was an element of security. Now there's fear. And the people are supposed to provide security. If they fail, and the police have run away, then there's absolutely no security. Replacing satisfaction with hunger. Everybody's hungry now, begging for food. The shedding of blood, indecent attacks. Many women have been raped, FYI. But of course, they don't publicize that because their media is claiming it's peaceful demonstrations. So anything which conflicts with the peaceful demonstrations, they won't show you. They will show you the army or the soldiers shooting at the civilians, but they will not show you what the civilians were doing five minutes before that event took place. Because the media it has a goal and objective uh, to, to convey to the people, they want these guys to go away because democracy needs to come in. How does that happen? By inciting the youth to continue doing what they're doing so they will feel they're wronged and oppressed, so they will continue in their ways. Looting of wealth, cutting off the past, the spreading of fools and foolishness, spreading of ignorance, reducing knowledge, weakening of the re religion, weakening Islam. I will skip that because of time constraints and go to the last aspect. The third aspect. The question which we must ask ourselves now is, are we Muslims today in agreement with the guidelines which we presented? Is what's happening today, is it in agreement with the three criterions, the lawful means, the flag of Islam being called for, publicly and avoiding the greater harm. I'm afraid, Wallahu alam, we're not meeting any of them. We're not able to meet on any of these criteria. One wouldn't have been enough. Two wouldn't have been enough. Three was the condition. I don't think we have even one. Not the means is lawful, nor are we calling for Islam. We're not saying everyone. Of course, there's a minority, alhamdulillah, that calls for Islam. But they're among the masses, you can't even hear them. And thirdly, the evil which we have gained so far is tremendous. We're sitting far away. 
You're sleeping in your comfortable bed, you're eating your fancy dinner, and you're having good old time. We're not experiencing what the people are experiencing there. This is what we may not feel. We may not feel. Imagine, Akhi, if you're sitting at home, you don't know the, who's going who's gonna to break in and, and rob you because there's no security in the country. It's a big deal. Right? It's a, we, you can't even do ibadah. You can even stand and pray two rak'at in your house, man. If you know that anyone may barge in on you any second, if someone may kill you any second, if your family's in danger because there's no security in the land, people are outside demonstrating, fighting. It's a very difficult situation. Final uh, directions or directives. Be careful of the media. Be careful of the media. I showed you the proof and evidence and you all know the game. The media is, is you know, uh, uh, regulated and, and screened and by particular people. I don't even, everyone in the world knows who they are. And there's a big agenda for the Muslim world from way back. Don't be a fool. And don't believe the hype, as they say. And don't be so shallow. Look beyond the surface. Understand what is being uh, you know, uh, prepared for us. And make sure that you don't fall into their trap. Be careful of the callers of fitna. Be careful of those who have no reservation declaring kufr against the Muslims. Some of the rulers, you know, in some of these countries have done some things which the scholars have declared as kufr. Alhamdulillah, the scholars have their job to do. And they speak the truth, don't worry. Not every scholar who doesn't declare the government which you don't like as a kafir is a, is a scholar who's paid by the government. No, Habibi. There are people who go by the Quran and the Sunnah. And who have been taught by the Quran and the Sunnah that the matter is not so, you know, uh, so haphazard. We have an organized way of dealing with things. Even when you want to declare someone as a disbeliever, you need to meet the criteria. So that's why we follow the way of the righteous predecessors. We don't jump into declaring kufr. Be careful of those who, will, who have no problem calling every government in the Muslim world a kafir. And this is injustice in the sight of Allah. People want freedom. Remember that what the people are calling for is freedom. And remember that freedom is, in the Islamic uh, view, restricted to the Islamic limitations. We have freedom. You're free to drink orange juice or apple juice. You can marry one wife or two. Sorry, sisters. Wrong example. You can have one car or two. You, you, you want to lead a certain life? No one, will, no one will impose on you how to lead your life. But in terms of freedom, in the ultimate sense, meaning uh, free relationships between men and women, uh, illegal, illegal, illicit relationships, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and the things I mentioned before, this is not part of Islam. This is not part of Islam, and Islam rejects that. So if the people are calling for freedom, they need to stop. And, they, and if you want to call for something, call for Islam. And don't do it while demonstrating. Uh, Realize that this is paving the way for the corrupt. There are people who take advantage of this, of such situations, to take advantage of the needy and weak Muslims. Don't pave the way for them. Don't make it easier for them to loot, steal, rape, and do the other crimes. And lastly, back to the way of the Salaf. Each and every one of us here and there and everywhere in the world we must every single muslim the, the eldest one to the youngest one all of us must go back to the quran and the sunnah according to the understanding of the righteous predecessors whom allah praised in the quran whom the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam praised whom he told us to follow at the time of change فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَرَ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِينَ تَمَسَّكُوا بِهَا وَعَضُّوا بِهَا وَعَضُّوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِدْ وَإِيَّكُمْ وَمُحْدَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ إِلَى آخر الحديث So whoever amongst you lives after me shall see a lot of differences, a lot of changes, a lot of changes. So hold on to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa and bite on it with your molar teeth and woe to you from introducing anything into Islam. This is the solution. 
and the way of the Salaf is the means must be in agreement with Islam and the goal must be in agreement with Islam. The element which is missing in the masses of Muslims today, all of us agree about the goal. All of us agree we don't want a, an oppressor, transgressor ruling the Muslims. Does anyone disagree? Would anyone like a, a, an evil person ruling the Muslims, imposing on them hardship? Absolutely not. We all agree about the objective. But we should also agree about the means. The objective should be Islamic, the means should be Islamic. What the masses are missing today, the means. This is why in the hadith in Darimi and others, when Ibn Mas'ud and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, when he, he went to the masjid, he saw some men sitting in circles, remembering Allah. He had some pebbles. He will throw, he will say, Sabbihumia, say subhanAllah 100 times, and he will count 100 times. They were doing what? People sitting in the masjid, remembering Allah. There are other people stealing outside, fornicating, you know, doing whatever. These people were in the house of Allah at the time of the Sahaba, remembering Allah. Abu Musa saw that. He said to, Ab to Ibn Mas'ud, Wallahi lam ara illa khayran. He said, I saw something that I kind of, you know, didn't like, but Wallahi, I didn't see anything except good. Yani people remembering Allah. Is there anything wrong with that? So he said, what did you tell them? He said, I didn't say anything until I came to you. Now listen now. Ibn Mas'ud went with him to the masjid. And he said, what are you people doing? They said, Ya Aba Abdurrahman, we're sitting here remembering Allah. Well, what's wrong? Anything wrong with remembering Allah? He said, count your evil deeds. Verily, I guarantee for you that your good deeds will not be wasted. How quickly you will destroy yourselves, O Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His clothes are still sound. His clothes are still available. Either, either you are upon a way better than the, that of the Messenger of Allah, or you're opening a door of fitna, or a door of misguidance. They said to him, Wallahi lam nurid illa khayran. This is the point he said, Kam min muridin lil khayr This is the this is the slogan that we need to internalize. He said, How often does someone intend, intend good but does not acquire it? The way of the, the what is the goal? Remembering Allah. Remembering Allah. What are the means? Innovated. Using pebbles, counting a hundred in congregation. Something the Messenger of Allah didn't do, alayhi salatu wasalam. It's in the remembrance of Allah. The means you're trying to do for the goal of remembering Allah are not according to our way. He said, you are opening a door of misguidance. And then he told them that, I heard the Messenger of Allah describe the khawarij. People that will recite the Quran, it will not go beyond their throat. And I think you are of them. The one with him said, Wallahi, when they fought, the khawarij fought against the Muslims, most of them were from that group in the masjid. The same people that want to go against Sahaba and killing them. Remembering Allah. What was their deficiency? Oh, the goal, brother. Brother, you saying that we should love Husni Mubarak? Why, ya akhi? Why this extreme? Either I love him or I, you know, I abandon the deen. No. It doesn't mean we're happy with any oppressor. But it doesn't mean that we will ignore the means to get rid of the oppressor. This is why our way is, is submission to Allah. The way of the righteous predecessors is that they don't impose their intellect emotions against the textual evidence. When you have a textual evidence, you must abide by it. So this is the, the final part. Understand this. Ibn Mas'ud was emphasizing, your goal is good. How often does someone want goodness, but he will not obtain it. He will not attain it. He will not acquire it. Why? He didn't use the means of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Demonstrations are not from his way. Calling for something other than Islam is not from his way. And creating more evil than the currently existing evil is also not part of his way. So all Muslims, where are you going? What is the solution? You. You, 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 and them, and your children. This is the solution. Muslims who love Islam, Muslims who raise children according to Islam, Muslims who practice Islam, when the community, the society, the country, the ummah at large 
is in agreement with the deen, submitting to Allah, Allah is the one who will give victory. Allah is the one who will give us firmness upon earth. Allah is the one who will establish for us the khilaf on earth, not our strength, not our screaming. Allah. In Allah, yansurkum wa yuthabbit aqdamakum. If you give victory to the deen of Allah, He will give you victory and keep your feet firm. Now we want the last part, but we're not doing the first. They are, they are trying to bring about the change by chanting, screaming, and singing, and dancing in the streets. Mixing between men and women. All the deen of Allah is being violated 24-7, and they couldn't care less. No one even says, this is a munkar. Oh, big deal, brother. Now you get, it's inevitable. No, it's not inevitable. Well, they were mixing from before. What does that have to do with anything? We're saying now you're trying to use a means which is not in agreement with Islam. What they were doing before was not part of Islam. Now you want to make a change, it must be with Islam. You can't use the haram that they were doing to bring the change. It happens by us changing. Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is within themselves. We need to change, rely upon Allah, rely upon Allah. And I told you before, Al-Hassan Al-Basri, when Al-Hajjaj had killed 120,000 Muslims, Al-Hajjaj killed 120,000 Muslims, and they came to Hassan Al-Basri and said, Ya Imam, this ruler, this oppressor has killed the Muslims. He killed many of the righteous tabi'een. He told them, Inna Al-Hajjaja niqmatan, Inna Al-Hajjaja niqmatun min Allah lam takun. He said, the Hajjaj is a punishment from Allah. وَإِنَّ نِقَمَ اللَّهِ لَا تُدْفَعُ بِالسَّيْفِ إِنَّمَا بِالتَّوْبَةِ وَالْإِنَابَةِ وَالْإِسْتِغْفَارِ He said, and the punishment of Allah cannot be fought against with a sword, rather with repentance, with humbling oneself and returning to Allah. When we Muslims are good, then good people will be in charge. In this country, alhamdulillah, because of the Islamic orientation, the many scholars, the many du'a, Alhamdulillah, Islam is being applied. In many of the other countries, if you gave them Islam, they will reject it. Except the minority. The majority, if you give them Islam and impose it, they will say, no, it's too much. It conflicts with my worldly interests. So we need to be very careful there. And we need to start the change today. How? Don't write a big board sign and, and run in the streets. Begin in your house. Make Islam the governing force. And we need to take this matter seriously. All of us, each one has an obligation. Raise the next generation upon the deen. Allah will give us, Allah will give us dominance. Allah will keep our feet firm. And Allah Azza will aid the Muslims. Inna Allah amanu. Allah defends those who believe. When we believe according to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a manner pleasing to him, Allah will defend us. We won't have to worry about anyone. Ask Allah Azza wa to rectify the condition of the Muslims and to guide all of us to that which is which is pleasing to Him, correct and in agreement with His legislation. Any questions? Yes, sir. Either way. Once something, we go, the, the answer is in the lecture, Habibi. The brother was asking about the demonstrations when the, the Prophet ﷺ was made fun of. Or, yeah, it's the same thing. We, we reject that. The, the, the solution is available in Islam, not in demonstrations. Uh, what should we as Muslims do when we see all the Pro protest and stuff happening worldwide. Uh, that's what the lecture was about. Uh, and how do we stop other Muslims who are constantly sharing such stuff? I mean, what should we tell them? Uh, you share with them the lecture. Inshallah. And what? Yeah, I mean, uh, inevitably. Uh, what is their difference? Uh, why is there a difference between the scholars? Uh, because Allah Azza wa gave people various level of understanding of the deen. And He made more, uh, He made some, I'm sorry, uh, more, uh, you know, uh, more spiritual, yani as they call him, alim rabbani, uh, alim who's, who's uh, fearful of Allah, pious, God-conscious, and has all the qualities and the criteria. Someone who's well 
uh, grounded in knowledge. Really, that's the element of dif difference. That's why, for example, in the early time, not all the Sahaba were alike. Ibn Abbas, Ibn Umar, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, uh, uh, Mus'ab ibn Umar, these stood out. They stood out as people of knowledge, as scholars. Aisha uh, was different than the rest of the Sahabiyat. She was more knowledgeable than the other wives. So it's the Sunnah of Allah that the people will not be all, they will not be all the same. So, you know, that's why scholars differ. They understand the text differently. This is provided that you mean by the scholars all of those who are upon Ahl, Ahl, uh, the way of Ahl Sunnah or Jama'ah. If you mean by scholars of deviance, then obviously they differ because they don't adhere to the Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of our righteous predecessors. Uh, you said photography is haram. All the rest of the world famous scholars say it is allowed with certain limits. Bring them. <laughs> nice claim. World famous scholars. If you mean people who come on uh, you know, the English speaking TV channels, which is fine, not undermining them, alhamdulillah, uh, then jazakallah khair. But these are not what is intended in Islam by world famous scholars. These are way world famous du'at with a lot of knowledge sometimes. And yes, some of them may be scholars, but if you refer to those, then you have misunderstood who the world famous scholars are. And I've said it before, it is impossible, impossible for a person who doesn't know the Arabic language to become a scholar in the ultimate sense. Impossible. Impossible. Do you understand me? He could become very knowledgeable about comparative religion and what have you. The deen of Islam, the Quran, the Sunnah are in Arabic. Without Arabic, you can't go. You can't. And if you're relying on translations, guess what? You're relying on someone's biased opinion and biased translation. Not everything has been translated. So with all due respect to all of them, and perhaps in the sight of Allah, they're better than 20 people like me, and I have no doubt in that, still, these are not the world famous scholars. The world famous scholars, I could bring you, and none of them, none of them says it's halal, except Sheikh bin Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala, and we, we explain his position in the lecture, where is this wedding heading, and we said that the Sheikh rahimahullah wasn't sure, he had conflicting fatawa, and, he, the, and even though he said that camera pictures do not fall under the regular, he said it's haram for you to keep a picture from memory. So the question for you is, fine, you can take a picture, what are you going to do with it? Not trying to refute you here, but just so I can make a correction. Sorry, I got overboard. Third, uh, movies like The Message have worked amazingly in enlightening non-Muslims and helping them understand Islam. And, and it was a trigger point which put an interest in many non-Muslims who later accepted Islam. So can we share such movies with our non-Muslims friends? And can we make enlightening videos on small issues like do's and don'ts? Can we use music in them? Whoops. Um, as for the message, it has music, right? It does? It does. It does. No message for you. My message for you is, don't use the message as means of doubt. Don't. Unless you're able to take out the thing. And plus it has other issues. The fact that Sahaba, are being portrayed with a, with a particular man playing their role, according to the ulama, that's a big no-no. Some of them said it's fine, but it's, it's very, you know, because you may, you may uh, you know, uh, make the Sahabi appear in a manner which is not in agreement. Furthermore, those who make these movies are movie makers. They're not people of Sira. So they will, in, in, and they have involved incidents which are inauthentic, which made some of the Sahaba look bad. So generally speaking, this, the message is not an effective tool. The best tool is the tool that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used. We don't deny that sometimes using something wrong will bring about a result. You can tell someone to pay you, I'll give you an example. You can tell someone, okay, please give me the 5,000 5, riyals which you owe me. And he says no. And you can pull out a gun and say, you better give me that money. He will give it to you. <laughs> now, you, you got something good. It, it did have a good result, which is what? Getting your money back. But how did you do it? Huh? So, you know, you may ask for something or you may do something which brings good results, but the thing in and of itself is still no good. So the fact that there are some good results doesn't make it an acceptable means of da'wah. Music is haram, absolutely haram. Please refer to the lecture, uh, the classical hit, It's Bad, wherein we discuss the ruling of music, Singing and Nasheed. Uh, can we keep nicknames? 
like if my name is Abdul Wajid, can I keep a nickname like Ali? Sure. No, I mean nickname. Yeah, it's a lockup. You may you may be uh, give. You may have multiple names. No problem. I don't know of anything that is wrong with that. Wallahu a'lam. I knew there was going to be an essay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. They said some good things in the beginning. I'm not going to mention them. I strongly condemn the fact that women and children are on the streets uh, protesting. And in no way do I advocate war. My question to you is, what are Muslim men supposed to do when they see their rulers become uh, servants of, of Israel and uh, they openly show that they have uh, abandoned the teaching of Islam and prefer otherwise when ruling, uh, for example, banning the hijab, telling the youth it's okay to sing and dance in the streets, do we leave them to rule? Also, this hadith, I believe, have significant meaning. Uh, whoever sees a wrong or evil action should change it first with his hand, second with his, uh, the one we quoted earlier, with his tongue, and finally, if he couldn't, then with his heart, which represents the weakest point of faith. Uh, so that's the first question. But we had mentioned already, we do not support, we do not agree with the ruler. And like I said, for example, Sheikh Luhaydan, rahimahullah, uh, hafizahullah, afwan, had declared a fatwa, just, uh, which I saw today, that the ruler of Libya is not a Muslim. But why? Because he denies the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, enough for us is the Qur'an. He doesn't believe in hadith. And he has made some other statements which the scholars have discussed with him, by the way. And they said and debated with him. He insisted on his position. Then they declared disbelief against him. So now, if a ruler has, the Muslims have declared disbelief against him. Now, going against him becomes permissible provided provided that you do not you have the ability to do so and that you do not initiate the bloodshed that was the fatwa of the sheikh he said if they shoot you then you shoot back you don't initiate the shooting he said try to get rid of him in other means the sheikh still said that demonstrations are not part of Islam demonstrations are not part of Islam he said try to get rid of him by other means and don't be the one who initiate the, the war this is because that particular individual has been declared by the scholars who I told you, fear none but Allah bi that he's not a Muslim. But if you say this now, that people have made the same declaration about other rulers without a just cause, without a ruler, uh, I'm sorry, a scholar evaluating his statement, speech, and saying, a person, uh, you know, not allowing people to practice Islam is not an act of disbelief. Is not an act of disbelief. So we have to be very careful when we just go ahead and say he's a kafir. So I hope that answers that question. Question number two, also when the people see an oppressor and, uh, and do not try to stop him, uh, see Allah will cause all of them to suffer a punishment because of him. Yes, these, like we said, sister, these narrations we know. All of these narrations we know. But Islam is not understood by understanding one narration. That's why I said in the beginning, the Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the Salaf. The Salaf knew these narrations, trust me. And the application of these narration was not as we are doing today. So, this narration has to be understood in the light of the other narration that specifies the ruler. And I gave you the example last time and I will give you the example again. If you want to apply this hadith like that, according to no principles in Islam, if you see your uh, father doing something wrong, you should tie him up with a rope and beat him with a baseball bat. Why not? Brother, he's an oppressor. He's oppressed my mother. He oppressed my sister. He did this to the neighbor. Blah, 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 blah. Then no problem. Can you punch your father? Can you go against him in the house? Scream in his face? No. The same source which told you if you see something wrong, change it, told you that when, you fought, when your parents tell you to do kufr, and if they both struggle against you to associate partners with me, do not obey them, but keep good company with them in the dunya. Even if your parents are kuffar telling you, come with me and worship Jesus, you're not allowed to obey them, but you have to be kind to them in the dunya. So the one who told you change evil told you how to deal with the parents. The one who told you change evil told you how to deal with the rulers. Now you can't throw away the other narrations and apply this one. This is lack of understanding of the deen. Scholars know the whole thing. They tell you, yes, 
There are these narrations and there are these narrations. Now you can be pick and choose. Oh, I like these ones, but you know, malish. These other ones really don't agree with my, you know, my feelings. So this is the problem we've been suffering from for, uh, from the beginning. That people want to abandon parts of the deen because they don't feel like it. So I hope that answers your question. I know your intentions are good, Jazakallah khair. But again, I'm being, I'm my, what my answer is not only for you. It's for everyone because these things have been asked. So my manner of speech is addressing the whole people. And not only you, your Jazakallah khair, your excellent question, good intention, inshallah. We don't doubt that at all. And everybody else, of course. Salaamu alaikum wa alaikum as -salam. If you don't mind, could you please tell me if you're going to upload the lectures, da'wah at your honor dignity, and Facebook can make you face on your website? Hello? <laughs> Facebook can make you face on like around 10,000 views, mashallah. <laughs> the, the most I've ever gotten in my life. And uh, this is good for the da'wah to spread. Actually, alhamdulillah, I give you the glad tidings. Many people have sent messages informing me that they've closed down their Facebook accounts. Many people. Many sisters took down their pictures. Azamullah khair. Aw jazahunallah khair. Alhamdulillah, that's why I'm happy it's getting views. Not for popularity. But because the, the message is being shared and Muslims are returning back to the deen. Anyways, these two lectures are old. Especially da'wah to honor dignity. Is ha it has been on the channel One Way to Paradise for at least a month now. Facebook has been around for a week or maybe less. And so you can watch both of them, inshallah, on the YouTube channel of One Way to Paradise. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. Is boycotting products allowed or is it a bid'ah? Please elaborate by the quote of a hadith. Well, there isn't a hadith which tells us whether boycotting is allowed or not. There are some narrations to the effect that the Prophet ﷺ continued to do business with the Jews even though they were uh, at war. And so the ulama used this as an evidence that, you know, that has nothing to do with, with this. Uh, some of the ulama hold a different view, however, and they say that, uh, you know, the context makes a difference. And, you know, this, uh, this product, for example, Prophet ﷺ was doing business. Did he know for sure that this money was going to be used against the Muslims? Whereas we have some companies now, food chains and otherwise, who, who you know, bluntly tell the people, yeah, this money we support, you know, X country with it and we help, you know, such and such. So really there's a difference of opinion among the scholars. I'm not in a position to give you a fatwa, but my advice to everyone who consumes doubtful uh, product which may be helping in the killing of Muslims, leave it alone. If it's a hamburger, leave it alone. It's a drink, soft drink, leave it alone. It's a pizza, leave it alone. Life goes on. Rather than taking a risk, you, you may be helping in the destruction of Muslims. I don't think any one of us will be willing to have a Muslim die so he can enjoy a pizza. Seriously. So just leave that alone, inshallah. Oh, sorry. Next question. Uh, is sacrificing one's life for one's country allowed in Islam? No. Uh, no, actually, when the Prophet ﷺ said, Yani, when they asked him, which is the shahada? He said, whosoever fights, حتى تكون كلمة الله هي العليا. ذلك في سبيل الله. That would be in the, in the cause of Allah. Whoever fights for the word of Allah to be the most supreme. Anything else, as we mentioned, is jahiliya. Qitlatun jahiliya. It's a death of ignorance. So, uh, no, there's no nationalism in Islam. Please briefly give examples what is a call for Islam. Give examples, what is a call for Islam? I don't understand the question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, um, Wa alaikum salam. You focus a lot in terms of uh, using the correct means if you want to change. And I think you established in your talk um, the current means of is not correct. Demonstration is not Now, apart from uh, what you mentioned at the end, focusing on yourself, improving yourself, your family, and so on, I mean, what other means are there for making change? means directed towards the dictator or the ruler as opposed to just yourself? A very good question. And uh, I mean, the, some of these means may be effective, some, some, of them, some of them may be ineffective. And so, I mean, of course, I could, like I told you, the Sunnah says that if you have an issue with the person in charge, that you advise them in person. One may say, okay, you know, this guy, man, you know, so many people have advised him, he hasn't done anything. So we say in this situation, the way of our righteous predecessors, as Sheikh Hassan Tabi mentioned, was being patient, being patient when the tyrant is oppressing the people and we make the change within ourselves. Again, the scholars have almost agreed that no ruler oppresses the people except that the people have caused that oppression. 
وما أصابكم من مصيبة فبما كسبت أيديكم. No calamity befalls us except that which we have earned with our own hands. So really, I cannot tell you. I do not know of any other uh, practical uh, solutions. We know that the, what is happening right now is illegal Islamically, and we know that the ultimate ultimate solution is rectifying oneself and family. And that's the only thing I have. I cannot invent other things, inshallah, that I don't know of. Now, anything else? You guys are fed up of demonstrations, huh? No, I'm stuck. Tayyip, I don't know when the le next lecture is, uh, and so you'll be notified via uh, SMS, inshallah. If you have not been receiving the SMS messages concerning the lectures, be gentle enough to come and write it down on the back of this, oh, I'm sorry, this piece of paper, and inshallah you'll be notified when the next lecture is. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.